Hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. I want to welcome you on behalf of Alice and myself, but mostly on behalf of Jesus Christ, because we are here together in the name of Jesus Christ. As we draw near to our conclusion in this study of the Sermon on the Mount, believe it or not, after more than half a year, um, I, I believe we may finish up in the, the base part of the study this, this week and then come back for a summary next week. Which would be That's very kind of, interesting. Which is kind of the, yeah. the plan, yes. Um, I've been blessed by it. I pray that you have. Amen, I have. Because it is the Word of God, and, and I've seen new things, got a new understanding as we've gone through this study, as I do every time we go through it. That's good. And when we do finish up, I just want to say, don't let it be the end of your study in the Sermon on the Mount. Let it be a, a, a kickoff to go in and study more and more and more and spend time. Because I promise you it is indeed, as, as it says, a living word. And seeing and, it in a different right, way. And you'll get fresh understanding, new understanding, as you go through it over and over That's again. Right. That's right. So, Father, we just thank you Hallelujah. that we can come together in the name of your Son, Jesus yeah. Christ. Yes. That we can come together with the confidence that your Holy Spirit is here to lead us into all truth as you promised. Lord, that we would grow in our understanding of your love for us, of your power, of the awesome nature of you, Lord God. Lord, help us not only to hear what you have to say to us, but then to go out and do what we have heard. To not only just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. I pray as Paul prayed, that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we would see wonderful things in your word like David prayed to the Lord. So, we pray that you use this time that we're together, Father, that we would see your Son Jesus more and more clearly, that we would understand your purpose, your call in our lives, that we would be better equipped to fulfill that. And I pray that in His name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Well. Last uh, session, when we left off, we were talking, we were in Matthew chapter 7, and we had spent the last hour on uh, verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And that's a question, by the way. <laughs> did we not? Well, I, I think that if you, if you missed last week, I pray that you go back and spend time and, and watch that uh, because it, it, as I said at the beginning of that it's truly truly important and the question is they may have done it in his name and they may have done these things but it, surely there's something wrong here because that's very evident in verse 23 when Jesus says and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness so that's where we're going to pick this, this part up, all right? And I want to look at two key ingredients in this verse, in this whole situation here, in this particular porridge of, of the word. First, Jesus says, I never knew you. Right? That means they weren't written. Right? And secondly, he's talking to people who practice lawlessness, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's not as though these particular people that we're talking about here, or he is talking about here, these uh, false workers, and that's indeed what they are, it's not as they were saved. Even though, you know, the, were they used by the Lord? I'm sure they were, because God made everything for His purposes, and He uses everything, right? Yes, He does. He uses Satan. But it's not as though, I don't believe, well, it can't be, that they were used powerfully by God and were saved, and then fell away. Now there will be a great apostasy. That's what yeah. the word says. But this is an apostasy. But this is an apostasy. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't say, well, I knew you. And then, no. he yeah. says, I never knew you. Right? So, they were never in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? right. They weren't written he, in the land no, of the right. Right. But I, It's key that you get this phrase, or I'm saying. Okay. They were never in a relationship with Jesus because he said, I never knew, knew you, right? right? These indeed are the tares among the wheat, right? Right. right. All right. This is going to sound, uh, I, I really want you to try and follow this uh, along with this, right? Mm -hmm. Before there was sin, mm -hmm. there was no religion. 
Right. Absolutely. Okay? Mm -hmm. There was only relationship. relationship. Right. There was only relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. There was no, no religion, religion, only relationship. Satan introduced religion, as we commonly use the term, when he told the woman what she could do herself. Right. That if she disobeyed God, if she did this, if she ate of this fruit of the tree that was forbidden for them to eat, that she would gain this godly knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. She could accomplish this, right? Right. Let me tell you, that's the beginning of religion. Mm -hmm. what you could because it's, it's trying to uh, achieve a spiritual goal through your own works. Mm. Like the Tower of Babel? Well, the Tower of Babel comes later, and we'll talk about that. Mm. But this is where it starts, all right? Because there is such a thing as, as, as religion, and there's kind of two religions, uh, in, in a sense, because... And I'm not even too far ahead of myself here, but God talks through James, yes. and He talks about what true, yes. pure religion yes. is. Right? Mm -hmm. What is that? Visiting widows and orphans, yes. caring for widows and orphans keeping in the distress, and keeping oneself unsaved from the world. But if you notice, that's a relationship not with God. No. Pure and undefiled religion in the eyes of God has nothing to do with your relationship with Him. Okay? Listen to this verse. You've probably heard it a lot of times before, but listen to it now. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. This is Paul writing to us. This is the Lord speaking to us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay? Now, salvation is being restored to a right relationship with God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ. Right. And he says, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. There is no way through works, through your own achievement, that you can come into a right relationship with God the Father. Please listen to these words. Please get this. Religion is about ritual. Mm -hmm. Righteousness is about relationship. Okay, did you get that? I, that's that. Okay, religion is about ritual. Righteousness is about relationship. Paul wrote to the Colossians, and he said this: "Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men." These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Right? So there is, Scripture says clearly, such a thing as this self-made, man-made religion. Okay? Mm -hmm. What God desires from us is relationship. Right. What He looks for is relationship. And he's not looking for the ritual. He's not looking for the religion as commonly used, right? These are words from the prophet that God spoke through the prophet Hosea. This is Old Testament, all right? Mm -hmm. In the time when man was under the law, right? For I delight in steadfast love rather than sacrifice mm -hmm. and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Mm -hmm. He has always shown Throughout Scripture. This isn't a New Testament concept. From the beginning, from the time of Adam and Eve, He has shown that His desire is to have a relationship with us. He's not looking for the sacrifice and the, you know, and the burnt offerings. That's not what pleases God. It says in Michael, what pleases Him? To walk humbly with Him. To just be with Him in relationship. This is ever, ever, ever so important. Because so much religion today, you know, this is not new. I said it started in the garden when the serpent approached Eve. But here it is now, thousands of years later. And it's still the same thing. It says, you know, and there's nothing new under the sun. And Satan has no creative power. He didn't thought anything new up. No. Now, he may be getting better at being a liar because he's the father of lies and the, uh, a liar by nature. Mm -hmm. He's had a lot of practice. Yes, he has. But it's the same old lie. 
And the lie is a relationship, what, what Satan promises is some kind of spiritual achievement through your own works. Something that you can achieve when in fact you cannot. There is no way. So now he talks about these people who practice lawlessness. Well, they say, well, we're going out and we're prophesying. Well, they're practicing sin. Well, wait a minute. No, not necessarily. Okay, that's what I thought. When... Not, not necessarily. Okay. I mean, maybe, because remember, God can use a donkey. We talked about this a lot last week, these false prophets, right? Yeah. These workers, they, you know, most of the miracles are, are magic, okay? Right. But the fact is, that's not the issue here. That's not the point. If they're practicing lawlessness, what is the lawlessness? Now, you're, you come to the conclusion instantly. That it's like, okay, it must be the things that they're doing. The prophecy, right? The, the miracles. Well, that's not what it says. And this is what's important, okay? I want to define the lawlessness that they are practicing. And the reason that this is important is because we need to continually examine ourselves and test ourselves to see if we're in the faith, right? Exactly. Here's the danger. What is, what is the foremost law? What is the foremost command? Hero is it? Aha, Shema Yisrael. Mm -hmm. All right? Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Now Jesus said, in, and this is in Matthew 22, verse 38, Jesus said that this was the great and foremost commandment. Yes, he did. Okay, so when we talk about the law, all right, practicing lawlessness, the first, the greatest, the first law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your money. Now, Jesus also said, when, when he quoted this in, in Matthew there, mm -hmm. he added, with all your mind, right? Mm -hmm. That is the law, the royal law of love. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. When the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said that in the perilous last days, Men will be lovers of self. At Second Timothy chapter chapter three verse two, right? That's the opposite. Okay, the great and foremost lawlessness. Okay, now remember, I just read to you the foremost. The great, the great and foremost lawlessness is loving yourself. It's self love, and that's why in Proverbs six, verse sixteen, where it says that there are six things that the Lord hates, and yea, even seven, are an abomination. Haughty eyes, pride is right at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Because that's the foremost. Mm -hmm. That's the foremost, and the greatest sin is pride, because it's a gateway to all oh, sin. Awesome. Alright? Mm. That's good. Now, Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke of God, right? Made clear the vanity of operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or, or the gifts, without the first of the fruit. Okay? Operating in the gifts without the fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, if he has to talk about this and warn about this, it is obviously possible. Right. But you can operate without ah, the fruit. So it's possible that these people were operating in, this gift, in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but without the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And remember, Jesus has just said here in the Sermon on the Mount that you'll know them by, by their, their fruits, fruits not, not by, by their, their gifts. gifts. Hello. <laughs> Because he said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all of my possessions, isn't that what he said? All. Mm -hmm. All. If I give all of this, all my possessions to feed the poor, and I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So it's possible to go out and do the miracles, to have the faith to move mountains. Mm -hmm. It's possible to give yourself up entirely, to speak, and not have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
So now let's look at these people who come rushing to Jesus Christ and say, Hey, Lord, Lord, look what I did. I did these things. But they're proclaiming their... It's a love of self. Self-love. Now, you have to understand something. There is a thing, you know... I And please understand, I'm speaking... I'm painting with a broad brush as the saying goes. Philanthropy is a, a, a dangerous thing. Because philanthropy is just, you know, people that are giving, 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 okay. Now, I'm not going to say giving is bad, no. but a lot of people give out of selfish reasons. For self-serving reasons. I mean, there are people who give just for the tax deduction. <coughs> there are people who give for the, for the because it's, it provides soothing to their guilty consciences. With philanthropy, oftentimes people give not out of the generosity, not out of, the, out of their heart, but before, because of what they're receiving. It's, I mean, you know, the base thing is people, some people give just for the tax deduction, right? right, right. Some people give because it soothes their guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. Some people give because they're looking for the pride, you know, the fulfillment of pride that comes with it. They'll, they'll, they'll be exalted for their giving, right. right? That doesn't mean that there are not people who give out of right motivations, but I'm saying that it's possible to give out of the wrong motivations. This is one of the reasons that the Word of God talks so much, I believe, about flattery and how flattery is an evil thing. Now, we're called, it says, to encourage one another today as long as it's still called today. Well, there's a big difference between encouragement and flattery. And what do you think the difference is? Well, the one is puffing up. The other is... Well, it's not so much about the, the object as mm -hmm. it is... The, the intent. The, the, the intent. Because oftentimes, people flatter other people not to encourage or build them up, no. but so that those people will think better of them than them. Yeah. It's, it's, it's self flattery is self serving. Right. I mean, encouragement and complimenting, and that's another. It says, "Give honor to whom honor is due." So there's nothing wrong with that. No. So oftentimes, encouragement and giving honor to one another can can sound the same as flattery. Mm -hmm. The difference is the motivation behind it. Flattery is self-serving. Yes. People flatter others so that those others will think better of them. Right. Not so that they'll think better of themselves. Right. Okay? And it's the same way in, in, in giving. A lot of times, I mean, just people, can, you can give for the wrong reasons. But here, it's clear. You know, these people come to Jesus and say, well, look what we did. You know, we cast out demons, we did miracles, we prophesied. Well, Paul's saying it's possible to do all those things. Mm -hmm but to do them without the proper motivation, yes. which is love. Right, right. And he's saying if you do them without, and, the, and love is not the foundation of them, it serves no purpose. That's right. Mm. Okay? Absolutely. Right. So, again, you'll know them by their fruit, not by their, their gifts. gifts. Okay? Now, but these, I, I am convinced that these boasters, and that's what they are, they're mm -hmm. prideful boasters, who come into the presence of Jesus Christ and come saying, hey, look what I did, right? Mm -hmm. That these boasters were thoroughly convinced that they were serving God. But self-convinced mm -hmm. that they were pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. They were deceived and thoroughly self-deceived, believing that they had a relationship with the Lord based on mm -hmm. their works. Whoa. Mm. They had the ritual. They never had the relationship. No. Jesus at no point says here in this, you didn't really do this. No. All he says is, I never knew you. He, so he's not talking about their works, he's talking about the relationship. Religion is ritual, works. Righteousness is relationship. If you learn one thing from all of this half a year of study, Learn that one thing. Because what God desires is a relationship with you. Absolutely. He's in love with you. He wants you to be in love with Him. That's what it's all about. It is not about how frequently you go to church, how much you tithe, how much you how you dress when you go to it's not about that. It is about your relationship with Him. And because this, He loves you. And isn't that what people in the world are always looking for? Is a relationship. Yeah, but they're being convinced by the world that it comes through works. Well, it works, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That you have to do something to achieve that, to earn it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I um, think about what I just said. All right? These people are utterly, utterly self-deceived. Mm -hmm. 
Now, that doesn't mean that Satan didn't play a part in deceiving him. Well, if he but was they bought into it, right? Yeah. Now, how, do you get to, how can you get to that place where you can get so self-deceived? Well, Jesus said this in John chapter 8. If you abide in my word, if you live in my word, the truth. you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make... It says, first of all, you shall tr truly be my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you're not abiding in God's word, if you're not, and I'm talking about knowing God's word, isn't that what that verse I read before? That he's not looking for the sacrifices, he's looking for that steadfast love and that knowledge of God. Okay? If you're not abiding in the word, you will be deceived. Yes. These people, you know, it says the heart is deceitful above all else. You've heard it. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? That's a wide road. So what, the, what, is, what matters is the truth. Now, I, I'm wondering, and I'm not, this is kind of my opinion. I'm not saying this is the Lord, but it just struck me, curiouser and curiouser. Is this the grieving the Holy Spirit that Paul writes the church in Ephesus about mm. in, in Ephesians 4.30? I know this. The ministry of the Holy Spirit for us is to lead us into all truth. Yes. yes right? Yes. In John 16, Jesus said, when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, right? Or whatever He hears, He will speak. Just like Jesus did. Right. So, the, whole, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let, let me just tell you, that very, to oversimplify things, the way this works is that the Spirit of God leads you to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ leads you to the Father. Bada bing, bada boom. That's the plan of God. To restore us, to repair us with God the Father, to bring us back into that right relationship with Him. Right? Now, there are a lot of things that are true. Two plus two equals four. That's true. That's true. Okay? Alice is cute. That's true. That's well, true. That's no, it's true. That's it subjective, is. isn't it? Well, yeah, but it's true. Okay. <laughs> there, there are a lot of things. It's, it's rainy in England. That's true. Okay. There are a lot of things that are true, but there is one thing that is the truth. John 14, 6. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. I am the truth, the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. That means that nobody comes into a relationship with God the Father relationship except through Jesus. But we don't get to Jesus except from the Holy Spirit, unless the Spirit draws them, right? That's right, right. Okay. So, I, I'm, I'm, I question that if you think you can get to Jesus, or you can get, even get, if you can get to God the Father on your own, by your own works or your own achievements, mm -hmm. if you have not grieved the Holy Spirit, because you've left whose, it min out. whose ministry it is mm -hmm. to bring you to that place, right? Very interesting. Yeah. Now, Alice said at the beginning of this, she mentioned Babylon. Babylon is kind of the epiphany of organized religion. Or it really is, okay? Uh, that the error of Babylon was to attempt to reach heaven, to reach the presence of God their on their own, right? Mm -hmm. The heritage of Babylon today is man-made religion. That's right. And that still makes the same ill-fated, empty promise today that it made mm -hmm. back then. And trust me, many quote-unquote, certainly, virtually every every false religion is a religion based on works. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know of any that is not. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know of any other religion that, that preaches the grace of God, mm -hmm. the free gift of God, mm -hmm. as Christianity does. That's right. the, the problem is that m most Christian cults also practice salvation or a right relationship. Salvation and right relationship, they're the same thing here. By works. Right. That you come into that right relationship with God the Father. something you have to do. You have to achieve it. You have to earn it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Where Scripture clearly says, not of works lest any man should boast. So, these workers of miracles, these prophets, these people did not hear, at the end of the day, they did not hear the words that I long to hear when they come into the presence of Jesus Christ. No, I did not. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. 
Now, that's not because of your works. It's because of your love for Him. It's based on love. It's based on the relationship. The foundation is love. The foundation is love. We said, and uh, at the beginning of this study, and many times through it, that what the Sermon on the Mount is, is about taking God's people. Because remember, this is a message to the disciples and the apostles. This is a message of taking the people of God from religion to righteousness. In the beginning, it contrasts the actions of the Pharisees who were living religion to what Christ said, which is living righteously. Now, what I want to do, because we will conclude this in our, our next episode, is to do a summary, kind of look at... Just and, put it all yeah, together. Put it all together and, and you know, come up with See it as a summary. whole instead right. of in pieces right. as people are right. looking at it. Through. Yeah, but, but if, if right now, if I were to summarize it, that's what I would say. This is a transition from, from looking religious to living righteous. That's what it's all about. And that's the problem here. Mm. These people that approach Jesus, they look religious. Trust me. Yes. These are the people that people would have looked at. Yeah. They're working many miracles. Right. They're prophesying in His name. They're casting out. These are the people that looked religious because they're out doing the things. And yet they had absolutely no relationship. Mm. So please, don't ever forget this. It is so easy. Not I was going to say it's possible, but it's easy when you're not being led by the Spirit of God to look religious and never have a relationship with the Lord. Mm. Okay. So, let's, let's go on now, because now we're at the very end of this. I'm going to read uh, the, the last, well, some of the last verses here. I'm going to go up to, uh, from verse 24 to verse 27. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Yeah, I know the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You know, it says in the Psalms, it says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Right? I know I've mentioned these verses during the course of this study, but I want to say them again. Paul and Romans. Romans 2.13 said, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law who are justified. James, in one chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 said, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Remember we talked about deceiving yourself? Right, yes. They delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and, and is not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. Boom. You just, you know, you see this. They didn't have clear mirrors back in those days either, right? So it's not just a matter of hearing what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. What is important is that we do what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Because Shema means, in to, Hebrew, to hear. To hear. Shema, Shema means, means to, to obey. To obey. I, I know, maybe you have not heard that mm. here before, but that's exactly right. The Hebrew word for hear, Shema, mm -hmm. and the Hebrew word for obey, Shema, Shema. it's the same word. Same word. Because it is inconceivable to God that's that right. you hear Him and not obey what He says. Right. I mean, that is stupid. Well, it's, it is all mankind is stupid. Yes, There's a lot is. of stupid people out there. Yes. So the thing is, whatever you do, it has to be built on the foundation of God's Word. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying here, right? It's not just if you're going to be a minister, stand behind a pulpit and preach pretty sermons. Mm -hmm. It is whatever you do, whatever you do, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, whatsoever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, rather than for men. Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do. 
If you're a plumber, you had better plumb based on the Word of God. If you're a carpenter, you had better carpent. I don't think that's an actual word. With the foundation of the Word of God. The Word has to be the foundation and the guiding light of everything that you do. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. No matter what you do, it has to be built upon the rock. You know, you are, I, I can speak for myself. and I, I, You know what? I can say this confidently for anybody who is saved. That God lifted, reached down and lifted me up out of a pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock. A rock that is higher than I. We have to have everything on the foundation of that rock. Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. He is the cornerstone. If you don't build your family, your, your marriage, on that cornerstone, if you don't build that your marriage on a foundation of hearing the Word and doing the Word, it's going to collapse. Because you want to know something? The storms are going to come. It's doomed for failure. We in the world, in the world, have built the economy on sand. Yes. Shifting sand. And we're seeing it. And it's collapsing. That. That is. Everything in the world is being has been built on shifting sand mm -hmm. because we've done it our own way. Mm -hmm. The word of God says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord. I mean he'll he'll do it, right? Now we're seeing the storm come. The storm rage against what man has built yes. and it's collapsing around us and we're saying why and you want to say you can cry out to God all you want but the problem is we need to we need to repent and you know what the people at Barclays Bank or HSBC or Wells Fargo Chase you know who needs to repent the body of Christ that's right absolutely uh, they don't know any better I'm, no, and I'm sure that you know what it says in Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name, it's up to us to turn from our wicked ways, to seek the face of God, to pray and seek Him. And then he says, then he can heal the land. But that's, not, that's not happening. Um, you know, I, I don't know what to say other than the fact that it's not happening. No, it's not happening. We've built on sand. The storm is struck. And it's collapsing. But you and I, who are in a relationship with the Lord, are on that, that solid rock. But don't be deceived. Don't be deluded. It is easy because the world is out there. and the, You know, it's like God said to Elijah. You know, you had, it's a still, small voice. The Lord roars from Zion. Mm -hmm. Wisdom stands in the street and shouts. I know all these verses, but I'll tell you what, the, it's that still, small voice that you have to hear the Lord speaking to you, because that's what builds faith. Faith yes. comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's right. And it is that faith in Him that will give you the trust to obey Him. And that obedience will lead to the blessings of God. And I'm not talking about stuff. No. I'm talking about the true Enjoy. blessing of God is to be in His presence. Yes. To be in that relationship with Him where you are in the shelter of the Most High, the shadow of the Almighty, where you are in the palm of His hand, where you are in that place of safety, no matter how the storm rages around you. You know, I was just thinking about how, what, what it is, what it does to you when you're in a relationship with somebody that you have complete and utter confidence in. It's wonderful. That's how it, it is. is. Yeah, it's, it is. I mean, there's just nothing that can shake you. It's very, very nice, thank you. Yes, it is. It's very, very nice. Very God nice. been very, very good to me. Because God <laughs> never fails. No, He, he doesn't. Um, never. And, and that's never, His only desire. Never. <laughs> his only desire is to have that relationship. Okay. Um, okay. Let me let me just go on here then, right? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Right. Let me just build your house. Build, build your, build your, your marriage. Build your family. Build your business. Build your church. Whatever you build. And remember, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain. So build it on God's word, and that build it based on that relationship with Him. 
Okay? That's the only safety you have. So, at that point, in the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. Matthew 7, 28, mm -hmm. it says, When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at His teaching. For He was teaching them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. I have to say this again. There are many bad translations out there now. Yes. And that is increasing daily. Rapidly. Satan wants to disarm the body of Christ. Yes, he does. The only armament you have is the Word of God. The sword. If you are using the Message Bible, these last verses are a joke. If you're a using joke. it, burn it. I, I, you know, that may sound harsh, but I will, I will stand in agreement with Alice. If you're using the message thing, please, do yourself a favor. Go out and get something different. Alright? When Jesus had finished these words, because when you know something, if you're reading that, you're not hearing the words of no, God. You're, not, you're, not. you're hearing the words of a man saying what he thinks God should have said. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed. The crowds were amazed. Now remember, we talked about this in the very beginning, so so long ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that Jesus had gathered his disciples, named his apostles, and he is speaking to them. Yes. The crowds around were there and able to listen in, mm -hmm. but Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Right. right. So the crowds that were around were amazed at his teaching, because I, you want to know something. If you pay attention to his teaching today, it's amazing. It is amazing. Because it's radical. Oh. It is so different than what the world teaches. Right. So completely, absolutely different than what the world teaches. And it the is shame so, of it is. And it is so logical. Oh, it is. The most logical. Uh, the shame is that it is all too often different than what the, the, the church, the church is, yeah. is teaching. That's right. yeah. Yeah. We are to be radical. The word radical comes from the Latin for root. Same thing where you get the word radish, right? We need to get back to the root. First love. Right. And that's what he said. You've left your first love. Get back to your first love. Mm -hmm. We need to be radical enough to go back to the teaching of Jesus Christ here. Yes. And put aside everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you're hearing something different, and I know you're hearing something different from the world, mm -hmm. but if you're hearing something different from the church, please inside. examine that, all right? He was teaching them as one having authority. Not as one. Do you want to know something? Jesus doesn't just have authority. The Father gave him authority. Jesus is the authority. Because it says in the Gospel of John, nothing came into being except it came into being through him. He's the author of all things, and that's where the word authority comes from. He is the author, right? The Lord. I pray that you hear the word of God spoken with authority. Because you need to hear it from God. In our summary, next the next time around, I promise you we're going to talk about God's Word, which is theonoustos. It literally, in the Greek, what it means, and it should be translated this, God breathed. Because God took Adam, formed him in the dust of the earth, and breathed life into him. It is his breath, it is his Word that brings life to anything. And if you're not getting that God breathed word into you, you're the walking dead. Mm, zombies. Zombies. It's, this is not a joke, all right? Mm -hmm. Let me just tell you something else. It says that the crowds were amazed at his teaching. A lot of people, even today, but not so much, not, not like it was a, couple, a generation, even just a generation ago, but generations ago. You know, a lot of people here, not here, we're in England, but uh, back in the United States of America, talk about the Founding Fathers, and I'm on dangerous ground here, I know. Mm. But they talk about them, how, how they were Christians. They weren't Christians. Not at all. I'm, not, I'm saying, I can't say every single one of them wasn't a Christian, but many of them were not Christian, and yet they had a regard for, for most Scripture. But the morals. For the, for the moral teaching of Scripture. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist today. No. Doesn't exist at all today. Not at all. But people like Thomas Jefferson, who did not believe in, in Christ as the Son of God, believed in the moral teaching of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He was amazed at the moral teaching of Jesus Christ, and there's nothing like it. Right? right. right? But that's not enough. 
Being amazed at what he says is not enough. Being obedient to what he says is enough. Okay? <laughs> the problem is, today we're living in a world, and these are the perilous last days that Paul wrote to Timothy about, when people don't have any regard for the Word. People inside and outside the church have no regard for the Word of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I don't want to make this too locked into a time, because I'm, I'm praying that this message stays for a while, but uh, we're living in a time when the church is, the world is just venomous and hating the Word of God in ways that are just absolutely incredible. That's amazing. It is amazing. I mean, it's amazing because, not, you know, as you might expect in the illogic of Satan, they not only not only are they breaking the Word of God, they're breaking their own laws. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, and they can't see it. And they, of course, they can't see it. They're blind. They have eyes but cannot blind. see. They have ears and cannot hear. But within the church, you know, people are choosing to break the law of God mm. and being venomous about it. Mm. So we're seeing a transition. We're seeing that transition, and I, I, you know, without putting too fine a point on it, we're getting to that place where, as it has been prophesied, there will be a famine for the Word of God. Yes. yes. Where there'll be silence in heaven. I pray that you treasure God's Word. Treasure it in your heart. That's what Mary did, right? Because we're going to have to call upon that treasure. Yes. Because if you treasure God's Word in your heart, then God's Word will come forth from your mouth. Mm -hmm. And what comes forth from your mouth you will hear. be what guides and you'll hear. the direction of your life. That's right. Okay? Because the first teaching in here in the Sermon on the Mount is we're not going to be hypocrites. We're not going to say one thing and it disagrees with what's in our heart. Mm -hmm. what, we say is going to, what we say is going to agree with what's in our heart and what we say is going to agree with what we do. That's right. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ Hallelujah. because that is the purpose of this study. That's the purpose why you're here. That's the purpose why we are here is so that our hearts, our mouth, and our actions are in agreement because a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Amen. Unity. Unity. That's what we need, is unity. Mm -hmm. And unity won't happen between me and you until unity happens with me. And thus, the prayer, unite my heart to fear thy name. So, we're going to, this is a little bit early for our, our normal sessions, but like I said, I, I don't want to get into a summary of this starting here, because I want to devote our next and final study in the Sermon on the Mount to just kind of an overview of what we've looked at in the past six months, a little more than six months. Um, and, and again, I pray that what we've done for the past six months is not the end of your time in the Sermon on the Mount. I, I pray that it would be a, a starting point that leads you into deeper and deeper knowledge and understanding of the teaching of Jesus Christ, that it might become the rule of your life that you might lead the fullness of life mm -hmm. that glorifies the God and Father of our Lord right. Jesus Christ. Yes. So Father, we do. We just thank, thank you. Jesus. We thank you for this Special. wonderful time that we have had in this study. We thank you, Lord God, above all, for Jesus Christ who did for us what we could never accomplish on our own, what we could never accomplish by our own works, that we could never achieve by any action that we could take, and that's to be restored to a right relationship with you, Father. Thank you, Father. So we thank you for that gift, that greatest of all gifts, your Son, Christ Jesus. And we thank you that you have yeah. chosen, even still choosing, the least, the lowliest, yeah. the foolish, thank the you, weak, Lord. Thank you, Lord. to be the living temple of your Holy Spirit, to bring your presence into this world, yeah. and that you might be glorified in and through our lives. Yeah. We just bless your holy name. We praise you. And we do say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, be here next time for a summary, a wrap-up of this, this study in the Sermon on the Mount. And I pray that you've been blessed by it. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Let us know where you're listening from. Uh, and I, I will have news, too, about what we're doing beyond this mm -hmm. because we're actually 
We're going to take some of these things and, and turn it into a course that will help you achieve uh, a greater understanding of what your ministry is in the body of Christ and, and how to live out that ministry. Hallelujah. So that's, come, that's right around the corner coming soon. Uh, we've got another two months here overseas before we head back to the United States. A busy two months ahead of us. Yes. We're excited about that. Hallelujah. And uh, But we're, we're putting all of this together yes. with brothers and sisters in the States and with brothers and sisters here in England and in other, other places. Amen. So until next time, may the Lord our God bless Hallelujah. you, cause His face to shine upon you, give you peace beyond understanding, peace that the world can't give, and glorify Himself through your life. And remember, Jesus loves you a lot. God bless you.